Hi guys, Dr. Glenn Estebanis here from Surgical Teaching, and welcome to this video on acute appendicitis. So appendicitis is one of the most common causes of presentation with acute abdominal pain. So it's essential that as medical students, doctors, and other healthcare providers, we have a good understanding of the condition, what causes it, how it presents, and how we can manage it. And by the end of this video, that's exactly what you'll know. But before we carry on, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new content releases. So first of all, what is acute appendicitis? Well, it's defined as inflammation of the vermiform appendix. However, this inflammatory process may extend beyond the appendix to affect the adjacent colon. For those of you who aren't aware, the appendix is named vermiform due to its resemblance to a worm which in Latin is vermes. If we now take a look at the anatomy of the appendix, well, as we know, the appendix is a tubular structure which looks like a worm. It does vary in length between individuals and measures between 2 cm to 20 cm, so it can get surprisingly long. But the average length is around 8 to 10 cm. Typically, the base of the appendix is located at the point of the cecum where the longitudinal tinei coli converge. And by remembering this, it gives us an easy way to find the appendix if we're struggling to locate it during surgery. The arterial supply to the appendix is via the appendicular artery. And here we can see it branching off the ileocolic artery. Before running parallel with the appendix, within the small messenger of the appendix, which we refer to as the meso-appendix. As we shall see, the location of the tip of the appendix can be highly variable. However, the position of the base is far more predictable. Typically, we find it at a point two-thirds the distance along a straight line from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine, or ACIS, as we can see demonstrated here. We refer to this point as McBurney's point, after the 19th century American surgeon, Charles McBurney, who described this point as being the location of maximal tenderness in patients with acute appendicitis. And here we can see how it corresponds nicely with the location of the appendix base. Appendicitis is one of the most common surgical emergencies throughout the world. In the US alone, approximately 7% of the population will be affected, which equates to about a quarter million cases every year. Regarding the demographics of appendicitis, unfortunately for us men, we have a higher incidence, with 1.4 cases to every one female case. Appendicitis is more rare in extremes of ages so we don't often see it occurring in very young children or very elderly adults. And we'll explain the reasons for this a bit later. And as I'm sure you'll all have noticed from your times in hospital, appendicitis is far more common in adolescents and young adults. The underlying trigger for appendicitis happening is the obstruction of the appendix lumen. This can happen due to various reasons. However, the most common is as a result of faecalifs becoming lodged in the lumen. Faecalifs are essentially hard bits of faeces. But because we like to make things sound more impressive, we use the term faecalif, which translates as stone of faeces. The other causes of luminal obstruction include infections, lymphoid hyperplasia, in particularly in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, and especially important in developing countries, are parasitic infections, which can also block the appendix. And the last cause on our list is particularly important in older patients, and it's tumours of the cecum, which as they grow, may cause obstruction of the opening of the appendix. As we mentioned earlier, appendicitis is more rare in extremes of ages, and the reason for this is to do with the size of the appendix orifice. Now when we're born, this opening into the appendix lumen is really wide which means that it's very rare for any faecal lift to become stuck. And on the flip side of this, in very elderly individuals, 
the orifice is much more narrow than it is during adolescence. Thus, making it really difficult for any faecal lifts to gain entry to the lumen at all. But what happens after the appendix gets blocked? Well, firstly, the intraluminal pressure distal to the blockage increases. This rising pressure starts to prevent the return of blood via the small veins, causing venous congestion. As this venous congestion continues to increase, the pressure being placed upon the appendix walls eventually increases beyond the pressure of the arterioles. And therefore, arteriolar flow decreases, the appendix becomes ischemic, gangrenous, and then eventually it'll perforate. So hopefully that's a bit more clear now. The classical description, which is very accurate in helping us distinguish appendicitis from other differential diagnoses, is that the patient develops a vague periombilical pain initially. Over the next 24 to 48 hours, this pain then becomes localised to the right iliac fossa, typically around McBurney's point. As well as pain, the patient may also complain of anorexia and vomiting. However, it's important to try and clarify from their history as to the order of the onset of these symptoms, as vomiting that occurs prior to the onset of abdominal pain is usually indicative of gastroenteritis rather than appendicitis. Regarding the patient's bowels, this doesn't really help us too much, as the inflammation of the appendix can cause irritation in the adjacent colon, leading to diarrhoea. But, at the other end of the spectrum, it may actually result in the bowels developing an ileus. So the patient may describe having not passed any flatus or feces at all. As we've already mentioned, the position of the appendix base is typically found around McBurney's point. However, there is a relatively high variability in the position of the appendix tip. The majority of the time, the appendix is located in a retrocecal position so it lies behind the cecum. In 20% of cases, the tip lies in the patient's pelvis. The remaining possible positions are pretty rare, with paracecal and subsecal making up 2 and 1.5% respectively. And pre ileal and post ileal making up 1 and 0.5%. But why do we actually care where the tip lies? Well, the reason we care is that the location and the type of symptoms and signs that the patient experiences is often dependent on where the position of this tip lies. When we examine our patient with appendicitis, what do we expect to find? Well, typically, the patient is lying relatively still and looks pretty unwell. They may have a low-grade fever. And when we examine their abdomen, they're typically tender over McBurney's point. Which, as you remember, is two-thirds the distance from the umbilicus to the right asus. However, importantly, the examination findings may vary slightly, depending on the location of the inflamed appendix tip. For example, a patient with an inflamed retrocecal appendicitis may not be particularly tender over McBurney's point due to the fact that the examiner's hand will mostly press against a non-inflamed cecum, which is lying anterior to the inflamed appendix. Also, in the case of a pelvic appendicitis, there may also be minimal abdominal tenderness. But the patient will complain of significant tenderness during a rectal or pelvic examination. Interestingly, Patients who develop perforation of their appendicitis may initially describe an improvement in their pain, as the pressure that was building up within the inflamed appendix is suddenly relieved. However, this typically doesn't last long, and the pain will become more severe and more diffuse, as the inflammatory fluid, pus and faecal material distributes itself around the abdomen and causes widespread irritation of the peritoneum. Additionally the patient will start to demonstrate features of sepsis. Now we surgeons love clinical signs. So what signs can we elicit 
in someone who has appendicitis. Robsing sign describes when the patient is palpated in the left iliac fossa, and this results in pain in their right iliac fossa. It occurs as a result of the inflamed appendix irritating the overlying parietal peritoneum. So as we palpate the left iliac fossa, it causes the parietal peritoneum to stretch. And as the peritoneum overlying the appendicitis is already inflamed, this stretching results in the patient experiencing pain in the right iliac fossa. The psoas sign is another important sign to be aware of. This describes when the patient experiences pain in their right iliac fossa on extension of their right hip. Now this is a really useful sign in helping us to identify a retrocecal appendicitis, as typically an appendix which lies posterior to the cecum will lie upon the psoas major muscle. And if you can remember from your anatomy, the psoas major joins with the iliacus muscle to form the iliopsoas muscle, which is the main flex of the hip. Thus, by extending the patient's right hip, this will move the psoas major, and in turn will irritate the inflamed appendix which is lying upon it, thus resulting in the patient experiencing pain. It's important to consider appendicitis as a diagnosis in any patient with acute abdominal pain. However, the other differentials for the patient's pain will vary depending on their age. In young children, the key differentials include intersusception, Meckel's diverticulitis, gastroenteritis, and pyloric stenosis. In school-aged children, the list of key differentials also includes gastroenteritis and Meckel's diverticulitis, but also inflammatory bowel disease and mesenteric adenitis. Mesenteric adenitis is also referred to as mesenteric lymphadenitis, and it's a condition in which the lymph nodes in the mesentery become inflamed, typically as a result of the presence of a viral infection much the same way that lymph nodes in your neck may become inflamed and sore when you have a cold. There are some key differences that allow us to distinguish between it and appendicitis. But let's continue with the other differentials. If we look at adults, the differentials change slightly compared to our younger patients. They include colitis and inflammatory bowel disease, but also diverticulitis, pyelonephritis, and we also have to consider the possibility of a cecal malignancy, especially in the elderly patient. The diagnosis of appendicitis in elderly patients is slightly more challenging. And often, there may be a delay in the diagnosis, meaning that approximately 50% of older patients have a perforated appendicitis by the time they undergo surgery. Importantly, we always need to consider and exclude ectopic pregnancies in women of childbearing age who present with an acute abdomen. As well as that, we should also be aware of the potential for other pelvic and ovarian pathology, such as pelvic inflammatory disease, a ruptured or torted ovarian cyst, and a torted ovary, which although the latter isn't very common, it does carry a high risk of ovarian loss, especially if it isn't managed urgently. And if we suspect that there is a gynaecological cause for the patient's symptoms, then we obviously need to involve a gynaecologist as soon as possible. Pregnant patients are one group in whom making the diagnosis of appendicitis can be more challenging. This is due to the fact that as the uterus enlarges, it will displace the cecum and the appendix superiorly. Therefore, if appendicitis occurs, the patient may actually complain of pain that's located in the right upper quadrant as opposed to the right iliac fossa, thus leading to some confusion and sending us down the road to thinking they may actually have gallstone disease. Additionally, it's not uncommon for pregnant women to experience nausea and vomiting, and also have a leukocytosis, all as part of their normal process of pregnancy. So we can see why making the diagnosis in this group can be extra challenging. However, it's important to remember that perforation of the appendicitis and subsequent peritonitis carries a risk of fetal loss of between 26 
to 10%. So it's vital that we always have appendicitis in the back of our minds in any pregnant patient who has acute abdominal pain. Now, what investigations can we do to help confirm our diagnosis? Well, we can break them down into blood tests, urine tests, and imaging. Now, obviously, in any patient who presents with acute abdominal pain, we're going to perform a series of standard blood tests, including amylase, liver function tests, and renal function. And we do this to help exclude the key differentials. However, we're only really going to focus on the key relevant hematological investigation. If we have a look at FBC or CBC, the key thing that we're going to look for is whether the patient has an elevated white cell count or leukocytosis, as this would suggest active inflammation or infection and would support our diagnosis of appendicitis. However, having said that, it's really important to remember that leukocytes may actually be completely normal in approximately 10% of patients who have acute appendicitis. In patients with greatly elevated leukocyte counts, this is often indicative of the presence of a gangrenous or perforated appendicitis. The next blood test we can have a look at is C-reactive protein, or CRP. CRP is an acute phase reactant that is produced in the liver and released several hours after the onset of inflammation, injury or infection. In the patient with appendicitis, we would expect the CRP to become elevated. However, it's important to remember that this rise is not an instant thing, and it usually lags between 24 to 48 hours after the onset of symptoms. So just because the patient has a relatively normal CRP on admission, this does not mean that they don't have appendicitis, as the next day you could recheck the CRP and it may have shot up completely. Now moving on to urine tests. The first investigation we want to do would be a pregnancy test, which is most commonly performed with a urine sample, but it can also be performed with a blood test. Additionally, we'd also want to undertake a standard urinalysis, as you can see here. Now, fairly obviously, the key reasons we perform these investigations are to try to identify whether a female patient is pregnant and thus potentially has symptoms which are related to an ectopic pregnancy. And also, by undertaking this standard urinalysis, we're able to look for any evidence of a urinary tract infection that may be the cause of their presentation. Now let's have a look at the imaging we can do. We start with abdominal x-rays, which in all honesty are rarely really useful in making the diagnosis of appendicitis. Typically, we use abdominal x-rays to help exclude other key differentials, such as intestinal obstruction. We could also perform a chest x-ray, in which case we'd look for evidence of a pneumoperitoneum, which would be indicative of a perforation of the GI tract. We can also investigate our patient using ultrasound, which has been shown to have a reasonably high sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing acute appendicitis. Typically, the ultrasonographer looks to identify the non-compressible tubular structure of the inflamed appendix, and they try to obtain a cross-sectional image of the tube, and we call this the target sign. Our next imaging modality is computerized tomography or better known as CT. CT is the most commonly used imaging investigation in adults with presumed appendicitis. It's highly sensitive and specific, with increasing accuracy as the severity of the appendicitis increases. The typical features we look for on CT include a distended appendix lumen, periappendiceal fat stranding or edema, peritoneal free fluid, and an appendiceal abscess. If we take a look at this coronal image, we can see that it shows an appendicitis in a retrocecal position, but also slightly paracecal, with a distended lumen and also some adjacent fat stranding, which signifies some edema as a result of the inflammation.
Now looking at this axial image, we can see that it shows an inflamed appendix heading towards the midline. But additionally, we can also see an appendicolyph. When identified, appendicolyphs have a positive predictive value for appendicitis of 75%. Interestingly, we can also see the psoas major muscle lying posterior to the appendicitis, which helps us appreciate the psoas sign and how by moving this muscle through extension of the right hip, it would irritate the overlying appendix and cause the patient to experience pain. An alternative imaging tool, which allows us to avoid subjecting patients to radiation, is MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. However, currently, MRI has a fairly limited role in diagnosing appendicitis, mainly as a result of the higher costs that are associated with its use, and also the fact that it has a limited availability when compared to CT or ultrasound. Due to the complete lack of any radiation, it's safe to be used in the paediatric patients, and therefore it can be considered in this group if ultrasound is inconclusive. However, it's important to note that there is an element of uncertainty as to whether MRI is completely safe to use in pregnancy. So for this patient group, it's best to proceed with imaging in the form of an ultrasound, and then if this is inconclusive, discuss the case with your radiology department or consider a diagnostic laparoscopy, depending on the patient's condition. This is essentially when we insert a laparoscope into the patient's abdomen and find out what's going on. This can be advantageous as it can allow us to make the diagnosis and where applicable, treat the problem, for example, by removing the appendix. However, it is a procedure that requires a general anaesthetic. So, it's not without its risks, albeit very small ones. Once we've made our diagnosis of appendicitis, we should commence the patient on intravenous antibiotics and also give them IV fluids to help control any sepsis and rehydrate them. And then, we should proceed to remove the inflamed appendix by performing an appendectomy or appendicectomy, depending on where you're from. In terms of giving antibiotics and fluids, well, whilst it's good clinical practice to examine the patient and perform initial investigations before commencing antibiotics, we are still okay to commence IV fluids, as well as analgesia, to hydrate the patient and make them more comfortable. The issue with commencing antibiotics straight away is that it has the potential to skew the clinical presentation. So if you were slightly uncertain as to whether the patient has appendicitis or not, and you're awaiting a senior to review the patient and help you make that decision. But in the meantime, the patient's been given antibiotics. Then potentially the patient's clinical symptoms may be altered, and this can make it harder for the person coming along later to make a confident diagnosis. However, if you're really confident of the diagnosis, or is being confirmed on imaging, then it's obviously sensible to commence antibiotics as soon as possible, before you take the patient to the operating room. The mainstay of surgical management of appendicitis is, as we mentioned earlier, by performing an appendicectomy or appendectomy. We can do this via an open or laparoscopic approach. With the majority of cases in the US and the UK being performed laparoscopically. There are additional benefits from a laparoscopic approach, which are mainly that the smaller incisions result in a better cosmetic result. And also, as we've already mentioned, the laparoscopic approach allows alternative diagnoses to be established and, if necessary, treated. Whilst the majority of cases are now being performed laparoscopically, it's important for all trainees and students to have a good knowledge of both techniques. An additional point to remember is that in older patients who've undergone a successful laparoscopic appendicectomy, it's really important that we follow them up with outpatient colonoscopy or CT colonography as a means of excluding the presence of an occult malignancy. As unlike with the open approach, during which the cecum can be palpated and examined, this obviously isn't possible during the laparoscopic approach. So in theory, small cecum malignancies may be missed. Several complications can occur as a result of appendicitis. If the appendix perforates, this can lead to the formation of an abscess or a phlegmon. Or occasionally, the appendicitis may become self-contained, forming a mass, and the patient can recover spontaneously. 
Appendix abscesses occur in 2 to 6% of patients who present late after the onset of their appendicitis. The initial management can be non operative in the form of antibiotics, which have been shown to reduce the length of hospital stay when compared to surgical management. However, if the patient fails to settle with antibiotics, then we can proceed to percutaneous drainage of the pus, which in most cases does the trick of getting the patient better and allowing them to be discharged. But if that doesn't allow the patient to improve, then we can proceed to surgery. We have to remember that in older patients, if non-operative management is successful, we should be arranging follow-up colonoscopy or CT colonography to make sure that we don't miss an occult malignancy. As we've mentioned, in some patients, the appendicitis will resolve spontaneously. However, they may present later with an appendix mass. Now traditionally, the approach to these patients was to perform an interval appendicectomy, usually around about 12 weeks after the attack of their appendicitis. However, this approach has pretty much gone out of fashion, as what it was discovered is that only 5% of patients with successfully non-operatively managed appendix masses went on to develop a further episode of appendicitis. So the approach is now to leave these patients alone if they've completely settled. But having said that, there is a small risk that these patients may have an underlying appendiceal tumour. So some surgeons would advocate proceeding to surgery and performing an interval appendicectomy for this reason. So all in all, I know this may seem a bit of a cop-out, but there really isn't a hard and fast rule as to what's the best way to manage appendix masses. And this is likely going to be a debate that continues for some time. So let's recap the main points about acute appendicitis. Well, appendicitis is one of the most common acute surgical conditions. In addition to giving intravenous antibiotics and fluid, the standard management is to remove the acutely inflamed appendix via either an open or a laparoscopic approach. We also covered how the potential differential diagnoses vary depending on the patient's age and their sex. And also how diagnosing appendicitis can be more challenging in pregnant patients and the elderly. So it's really important that we have a higher degree of suspicion in these patient groups. And finally, it's really important that we remember that with older patients who are successfully managed non-operatively or laparoscopically, that they need to have follow-up colonoscopy or CT colonography to make sure that we exclude any occult malignancy. If you found this video helpful, then make sure you subscribe to our channel for more great free content. Or if you want to make learning for med school and board exams easier, then subscribe to surgicalteaching.com and check out our expert endorsed videos, high yield revision questions, and our supportive online community. Surgical teaching was designed by doctors to help students learn smarter. And right now, you can enjoy all of our great content for less, with 20% off our annual premium subscriptions when using the code STYouTube20. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you soon.